Hello friends, a very Merry Christmas to all. I am Samriti Banerjee. Welcome to my channel, The Mad Reader. In this channel, I narrate the audiobooks of different popular books and stories. In this video, I am going to narrate the third chapter, John Ferrier Talks with the Prophet, of the second part, The Country of Saints, of the novel A Study in Scarlet by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle about the timeless detective Sherlock Holmes. If you like this video, do click on the like button. Also, do not forget to click on the subscribe button and press the bell icon. Do share the videos to your friends and relatives. Finally, kindly write out your valuable opinions in the comment section as it helps me to get motivated and improve my videos. Before starting, I would like to give a summary of this chapter of part 2, A Study in Scarlet. The previous chapter had ended with the departure of Jefferson Hope from Utah for a couple of months. This chapter that I am about to narrate describes about the dark and sinister deeds and rumours about the Denied Band or the Avenging Angels. One day on a fine morning, Brigham Young himself comes to John Ferrier's residence and speaks about a grave sin on the way to be committed by the Ferriers and even considers the death of the Ferriers upon the Sierra Blanco 12 years back a better option than them being against the Holy Four. To know about that grievous sin, please listen to the whole audiobook till the end. So let's start. Chapter 3 John Ferrier Talks with the Prophet Three weeks had passed since Jefferson Hope and his comrades had departed from Salt Lake City. John Ferrier's heart was sore within him when he thought of the young man's return and of the impending loss of his adopted child. Yet her bright and happy face reconciled him to the arrangement more than any argument could have done. He had always determined, deep down in his resolute heart, that nothing would ever induce him to allow his daughter to wed a Mormon. Such a marriage he regarded as no marriage at all but a shame and a disgrace. Whatever he might think of the Mormon doctrines, upon that one point he was inflexible. He had to seal his mouth on the subject, however, for to express an unorthodox opinion was a dangerous matter in those days in the land of saints. Yes, a dangerous matter, so dangerous that even the most saintly dared only whisper their religious opinions with bated breath, lest something which fell from their lips might be misconstructed and bring down a swift retribution upon them. The victims of persecution had now turned persecutors on their own account and persecutors of the most terrible description, not the Inquisition of Seville, nor the German Wehmgericht, nor the secret societies of Italy were ever able to put a more formidable machinery in motion than that which cast a cloud over the state of Utah. Its invisibility and the mystery which was attached to it made this organization doubly terrible. It appeared to be omniscient and omnipotent, and yet was neither seen nor heard. The man who held out against the church vanished away, and none knew whither he had gone or what had befallen him. His wife and his children awaited him at home, but no father ever returned to tell them how he had fared at the hands of his secret judges. A rash word or a hasty act was followed by annihilation, and yet none knew what the nature might be of this terrible power which was suspended over them. No wonder that men went about in fear and trembling, and that even in the heart of the wilderness they dared not whisper the doubts which oppressed them. At first, this vague and terrible power was exercised only upon the recalcitrants who, having embraced the Mormon faith, wished afterwards to pervert or to abandon it. Soon, however, it took a wider range. The supply of adult women was running short and polygamy without a female population on which to draw was a barren doctrine indeed. Strange rumours began to be bandied about. Rumours of murdered immigrants and rifled camps in regions where Indians had never been seen. Fresh women appeared in the harems of the elders, women who pined and wept and bore upon their faces the traces of an unextinguishable horror. 
belated wanderers upon their mountains spoke of gangs of armed men masked stealthy and noiseless who flitted by them in the darkness these tales and rumors took substance and shape and were corroborated and re-corroborated until they resolved themselves into a definite name to this day in the lonely ranches of the west the name of the denite band or the avenging angels is a sinister and an ill omened one fuller knowledge of the organization which produced such terrible results served to increase rather than to lessen the horror which it inspired in the minds of men no one knew who belonged to this ruthless society the names of the participators in the deeds of blood and violence done under the name of religion were kept profoundly secret the very friend to whom you communicated your misgivings as to the prophet and his mission might be the one of those who would come forth that night with fire and sword to exact a terrible reparation hence every man feared his neighbor and none spoke of the things which were nearest to his heart one fine morning john ferrier was about to set out to his wheat fields when he heard the click of the latch and looking through the window saw a stout sandy-haired middle-aged man coming up the pathway his heart leaped up to his mouth for this was none other than the great brigham young himself full of trepidation for he knew that such a visit boded him little good ferrier ran to the door to greet the mormon chief the latter however received his salutations coldly and followed him with a stern face into the sitting room brother ferrier he said taking a seat and eyeing the farmer keenly from under his light colored eyelashes the true believers had been good friends to you we picked you up when you were starving in the desert we shared our food with you led you safe to the chosen valley gave you a good share of land and allowed you to wax rich under our protection is not this so it is so answered john ferrier in return for all these we asked but one condition that was that you should embrace the true faith and conform in every way to its usages this you promised to do and this if common report says truly you have neglected and how have i neglected it asked ferrier throwing out his hands in expostulation have i not given to the common fund have i not attended to the temple have i not where are your wives asked young looking round him call them in that i may greet them it is true that i have not married ferrier answered but women were few and there were many who had better claims than i i was not a lonely man i had my daughter to attend to my wants it is of that daughter that i would speak to you said the leader of the mormons she has grown to be the flower of utah and has found favor in the eyes of many who are high in the land john ferrier groaned internally there are stories of her which i would fain disbelieve stories that she sealed to some gentile this must be the gossip of the idle tongues what is the 13th rule in the code of the sainted joseph smith let every maiden of the true faith marry one of the elect for if she were a gentile she commits a grievous sin this being so it is impossible that you who profess the holy creed should suffer your daughter to violate it John Ferrier made no answer but he played nervously with his riding whip upon this one point your whole faith shall be tested so it has been decided in the sacred council of four the girl is young and we would not have her wed gray hairs neither would we deprive her of all choice we elders have many hay fears but our children must also be provided Stangerson has a son and Drebber has a son and either of them would gladly welcome your daughter to their house let her choose between them they are young and rich and of the true faith what do you say to that ferrier remained silent for some little time with his brows knitted you will give us time he said at last my daughter is very young she is scarce of an age to marry she shall have a month to choose said young rising from his seat at the end of that time she shall give her answer he was passing through the door 
When he turned with flushed face and flashing eyes, it were better for you, John Ferrier, he thundered, that you and she were now lying blanched skeletons upon the Sierra Blanco than that you should put your weak wills against the orders of the Holly Four. With a threatening gesture of his hand, he turned from the door and Ferrier heard his heavy step scrunching along the shingly path. He was still sitting with his elbows upon his knees, considering how he should broach the matter to his daughter when a soft hand was laid upon his and looking up, he saw her standing beside him. One glance at her pale, frightened face showed him that she had heard what had passed. I could not help it. She said in answer to his look. His voice rang through the house. Oh, father, father, what shall we do? Don't you scare yourself? He answered, drawing her to him and passing his broad rough hand carcassingly over her chestnut hair. We will fix it up somehow or other. You don't find your fancy kind of lessening for this chap, do you? A sob and a squeeze of his hand was her only answer. No, of course not. I shouldn't care to hear you say that you did. He's a likely lad and he's a Christian, which is more than these folk here in spite of all their praying and preaching. There's a party starting for Nevada tomorrow and I'll manage to send him a message letting him know the hole we are in. If I know anything of that young man, he will be back here with a speed that would whip electrotelegraphs. Lucy laughed through her tears at her father's description. When he comes, he will advise us for the best. But it is for you that I am frightened, dear father. One hears, one hears such dreadful stories about those who oppose the prophet. Something terrible always happens to them. But we haven't opposed him yet, her father answered. It will be time to look for squalls when we do. We have a clear month before us. And at the end of that, I guess we had better shin out of Utah. Leave Utah? That's about the size of it. But the farm? We will raise as much as we can in money and let the rest go. To tell the truth, Lucy, it isn't the first time I have thought of doing it. I don't care about knuckling under to any man as these folks do their darned profit. I'm a free-born American and this is all new to me. Guess I'm too old to learn. If he comes browsing about this farm, he might chance to run up against a charge of buckshot travelling in the opposite direction. But they won't let us leave, his daughter objected. Wait till Jefferson comes and we will soon manage that. In the meantime, don't you fret yourself, my dearie, and don't get your eyes swelled up or else he will be walking into me when he sees you. There is nothing to be afraid about and there is no danger at all. John Ferrier uttered these consoling remarks in a very confident tone, but she could not help observing that he paid unusual care to the fastening of the doors that night and that he carefully cleaned and loaded the rusty old shotgun which hung upon the wall of his bedroom. End of chapter 3 Thank you.